uh, we're, we're finishing off this uh, chapter 3 today. Chapter 4, uh, between chapter 3 and chapter 4, there's a distinct difference in tone. Uh, he's going to go, in chapter 4, uh, he's going to begin to go after uh, some of the issues with the, um, the false doctrine that was going around in the church. Uh, but we're wrapping up today the instructions for the church, for the, the functioning of the church. And so last week we saw the role of elders. Prior to that, we saw the responsibilities and roles of both men and women in the church. Uh, last week, overseers and elders, uh, same thing if you were here. Um, if you weren't here, I would just say, um, if you weren't here last week, you should, you know, the, the two studies really go together. Uh, of course, all of them do, but they go together in that they round out these two offices in the church, and they really overlap. Uh, the qualifications are, are, are really the same. In, in most regards, for the overseer and the, the deacon. Let's read, uh, beginning in verse 8 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Verse 11, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world taken up in glory. That last little bit is so beautiful. Uh, it's thought that it was uh, maybe part of a hymn. Uh, it was a creed or, or part of a hymn. Part of a, it was a creed that was in a hymn, perhaps, but really beautiful. Paul gives us, uh, uh, thematically, really, he gives us the, the theme of the entire book, probably you could just say of all of his writings. Hey, I'm writing to you. I'd like to come to you. But he's not really sure about his schedule. He says, I'd like to come to you, but if I don't come to you, I'm writing to you so that you will know how to conduct yourself in the church. It's, that's really, I mean, big picture, that's what he's writing about. All these instructions here, he's writing to pastors, uh, Timothy, and then we'll see when we get to Titus, he's giving pastoral instructions. This is how the church is supposed to function. And... Um, you know, we didn't get to the place we're at today, uh, contrary to some people's opinions. There are some that hold to the idea that the church shouldn't be institutionalized, we shouldn't have buildings, we should just meet in small clusters and homes. That's great, and, and, and there are times and there are places where that, the church did that, but, but that's not what we see in the New Testament. The church grew, the church organized, and the church became an institution uh, out of necessity, and, uh, and he's really affirming that by giving us these different offices in the church. It's not just this kind of super organic thing that, you know, a couple people just get together here and there, although uh, it, it can be and is in, in some places. So he, he introduces us now. Uh, notice the, 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 the transition here. He says, deacons likewise. So he introduces the, the word deacon there, but then says likewise. So he said, hey, we gave you the qualifications of the overseers, right? So he's tying the two together. Likewise now, here are qualifications for deacons. The de deacon literally mean, mean, means uh, one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master, a sergeant, attendant, or minister. Um, so uh, that's kind of just the working definition. It's someone who, who, who does what they're asked to do. They're, they're, they're a, a deacon is a servant. 
Um, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 6. We've got um, a beautiful picture of uh, 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 the need for and the working out of being a deacon in uh, Mark chapter 6. Every, because my head's been in a fog, it's like every, it's like I'm telling you to turn to Mark chapter 6, and it's like, is that the right place? Yeah, okay. Because uh, we're going to look at Acts chapter 6 in a little bit, but there's Mark chapter 6 first. Every, everything I say, I'm going to be hesitant with this morning, so bear with me. In Mark chapter 6, we have uh, the, you know, one of the, the, the tellings here in the Gospels of the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's a beautiful story that uh, most of us are familiar with. Uh, we're just going to pick up in verse 34 uh, and then read through the end of uh, this section 43. Uh, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so that we, uh, they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat. Verse 37, he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. When they had found out, they said five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up twelve uh, full baskets of broken pieces and also the fish. It's a great story, isn't it? If you've been to Israel and been to the, the, the hillside where this supposedly happened, it's just a glorious, glorious thing. Jesus is doing what he's supposed to do, right? He's, he's ministering to people. He's teaching people. That's what he's supposed to do. And as he's doing what he's supposed to do, a crowd develops. Now, it doesn't need to be a crowd of 5,000 to present the, the, the need for service, but this does present all kinds of needs. There's, you know, there's well more than 5,000 people. There's 5,000 men there. This is a huge crowd. And... Uh, it created a need, which was also an opportunity, right? The, the need, you could look at it as a need, and I think in, in some sense, the disciples, they're just the worry warts. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> you know, they're worried about spending the money. They're worried about feeding the people. And Jesus is like, relax. You can just give them something to eat. He knows what he's going to do. And, and, and so you see, the need presents the opportunity, and the opportunity is for service, and Jesus begins to give commands. He's the Lord. I mean, there's clearly a structure in play. Wouldn't you say? It's not like this is haphazard, and they're just, oh, I don't know, what are we going to do now? Jesus knows what he's doing. He's in charge. And he says, eh, you guys sit down in groups. Sit them down in groups, and he's, he's organizing the whole thing. Give them something to eat. He's, he's saying to the disciples, you guys are going to be involved in this. I need some guys to help me. Though he could do it himself, I suppose. He could have called down angels to serve. He didn't. He employed the disciples. And, and we see Jesus, he, he was working too. He was, he was praying. He was doing the thing that he was supposed to do. He was handing the food to the disciples and they were distributing it to all the people. There was a need. There was an opportunity, and these guys got to be involved. How fun do you think that was? How fun do you think it was to watch miraculously, to watch this five loaves and two fish miraculously multiply and be able to feed everyone, and then even to have 12 baskets left over? And you know, these guys cleaned it all up too. This was, this was a chore that what needed deacons. It needed people who would just simply do what the Lord said, and serve the people. That's exactly what we see here. And it's, a be it's just a beautiful story. And I, and I think, uh, you know, they were there and they were uh, capable of doing the thing that he asked them to do. And they ended, ended up getting to work alongside Jesus and witness this incredible miracle. 
He was doing what he was supposed to do. There are those whose task it is that was maybe in the, in the early church here, whose task it was to teach the Word, um, to study the Word and to teach the Word. Um, but then there's a demand for practical ministry. There's the, the teaching ministry. We talked about that. That s- belongs to the pastors and, and those who would be overseers in the church. As the church developed, there was more and more opportunity for uh, people to be involved serving. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 6 now. So now we get to see Acts chapter 6, which is commonly where guys turn uh, for the discussion of deacons and how the ministry developed and what it looked like and, and, and what the need was. As the church grew, just like in the story with Jesus' ministry, as the crowds grew, the need for practical ministry arose. And then later, uh, as the church developed, uh, there became, you know, all kinds of needs. And so we see in Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7, read along with me here. At this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God kept spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You see that the whole thing was growing. The whole thing was expanding. This is the early days. Everything was new. Everything was fresh. And uh, they were trying to take care of the, the needy. They were needy. They were poor people. They were widows. And as that work was increasing, I mean, there were thousands of people at this point. And this whole thing was without any organization. And so there was an argument. It's like, hey, our widows aren't getting served. What's the deal? There's not enough workers. There's greater need than there is workers. What are we going to do about it? And, of course, they came to the leaders, the the disciples, or the the apostles at this point. These guys were, they found themselves in leadership positions, not even knowing what they were doing. What do we do about this? So they got together and they said, okay, we don't, we want to be able to continue doing what we're doing and studying the Word of God, trying to discern what this thing is that we've laid our hands to. We need to be able to continue to do that and to pray and to seek the Lord for direction. Let us do that. Let's raise up some other guys to do this practical work. It was very, very necessary, and it worked. And they, they, they named these individuals. They laid hands on them. Of course, there was a there were some qualifications that they listed out there. They named the first official deacons. The office of deacon. And that's really what Paul's talking about here in 1 Timothy 3. He's talking about the office of deacon, not just the act of be, being a deacon or the act of serving Do you know that Jesus was both an overseer and a deacon? We talked a little bit about that last week. I I think it's important for us to understand that a deacon is not like a stepping stone to becoming an elder. I remember when I was a youth pastor and people would ask me all the time, oh, you know, are you going to get a church of your own? When are you going to be a real pastor? And it always kind of insulted me because I enjoyed being a youth pastor and I felt like it was a valid calling. 
And I never really saw it as something like, oh, I'll just do this for a while and then I'll, and then I'll become a real, you know. It's like the people who asked me one time at the school, when are you going to get a real church? <laughs> they haven't come back, by the way. We got a real church. They didn't come back. But anyway. <laughs> Deacon is not a stepping stone. It's not a lower post. It's a different position. We read last week, 1 Peter 2, 25, where he says, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. That word guardian there, episcopos, that's Jesus. That's his ministry. He's an overseer. That's, that's one of his roles in the church, and that's one of the roles that he's given to men in the church. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, though, and, and I would say, you know, we read this kind of thing of him even, it seems, more. It says, even uh, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That word there, serve, is deacon. It's the same word translated deacon, diakonos. Jesus Christ came to serve. So next time you're thinking, oh, you know, uh, all I've got are these menial tasks. The Lord was not too good for menial tasks. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes about how he emptied himself and became a bondservant. Jesus Christ took upon himself in his humanity the form of a bondservant. You recall uh, when he washed the disciples' feet. Such a beautiful scene there. After the meal, after he washed their feet, he said to the disciples, If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. See, Jesus taught us how to be a deacon. He taught us how to be a servant. He showed us by example. And he made it really clear, this is what you ought to do. This is what you ought to be, I believe. Personally, I believe everyone in the church should be a deacon. In the, in the sense of just general service, everyone in the church should serve. Not necessarily holding an office of deacon, but everyone should serve. There's a story told, you've probably heard it. It's the story of four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Yeah, some of you have heard this. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. Is that true or what? It's true. There's all kinds of work to do. There's all kinds of work to be done in this thing that we call the body of Christ. Uh, we're meeting in a building. Uh, the building requires maintenance. It requires upkeep and cleaning and all kinds of things so that you can come and it's warm and fresh and clean. We've got new cupboards back there. And, and the, the sidewalks down below are clear, and the vegetation is trimmed. There's all kinds of things to be done in that sense. But then there's other things. There's widows that need to be cared for. There's people who need assistance now and then. There's sick people who need visitation and assistance. There's all kinds of work within the body of Christ. I want to pastor, personally, I want to pastor a church where everybody wants to serve. And not only where everybody wants to serve, where everybody has opportunity to serve. Unless you find yourself grossly disqualified, right? Which I don't really know anybody who's grossly disqualified. He gives us these qualifications, and we'll go through them uh, they, they do overlap quite a bit, uh, what we went through last week. Uh, this is, again, this is the qualifications of the office of deacon. Those who would be just kind of named, hey, that guy there, that guy's a deacon. 
And, and I would just say, as, as we have that particular kind of office in the church, it's one that we recognize, right? I could, I could probably name off a dozen guys right now and gals who are deacons. I could. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I could do it. And, and, and it's not because I think, well, they're real, I like that person. It, it, it's that they just, they just do stuff. People just do stuff. And, and they, they, they see a, uh, an issue that needs to be fixed or, 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 or something that needs to be done, and they just get after it. If, if that's you, you're a deacon, whether you like it or not. We'd like to put a, you know, we'd like to, to name you a deacon, and then we can have greater expectations. <laughs> we won't, uh... and, that, and that's part of the reason why people do, oh, I don't want to do that, I don't want, you know, don't want too much expectations. The, the deacon must, he says, likewise, they must be men of dignity, dignified. Paul kind of summarizes this. I think this is just a kind of a summary idea with dignity. The King James uh, translation uses the word grave, which is, man, that's kind of a dark word, isn't it? Uh, but, but it gives us the idea that, that, that what Paul is saying, one of the qualifications of the office of deacon is that these guys ought to be serious. Do you guys like it when I get serious? I do. I get serious sometimes because I think this word is serious. I think the work, the ministry of the church of Jesus Christ is serious work in the world. And, and for those who would serve the Lord in some kind of an official capacity, you should be serious people. Not goof-offs. Doesn't mean you can't have fun, but, but, but there should be dignity, seriousness. One translator said that the word really means venerated for their character. Because they're serious. He goes on, he says, hey, the deacon ought not to be double-tongued. Ought not to be double-tongued. Again, not really language that we use a whole lot. The whole idea is that there ought to be some honesty, some sincerity in the deacon. The people who serve in the church should not be given to double-speak. People, I, 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 hopefully I'm never caught doing this. I, I, I know I've heard it of others. Uh, we've all certainly encountered people who do this. Where they, they say one thing to one person, another thing to another person. Uh, yeah, no thanks. Right? We, we, we don't want to do that. We don't want leaders who do that. We don't, I mean, literally, we don't want leaders. We don't want people serving who are liars. And also, I think another idea with this speaking with a, you know, forked tongue, double tongue, or whatever, is people who say they're going to do something and then don't do it. Right? We should be people who, when we commit to something, when we say we're going to do something, we should be expected to do it. James says, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, that you may not fall under judgment. We should do what we say we're going to do. We should say the same thing to, to, you know, different people. We should be honest and sincere. I think it's a great qualification. It's important. Not addicted to much wine. Again, we talked about this last week. It's one of the qualifications of anyone who leads in the church. It's, and and, and I, I want to just say this, because in our present day, this needs to be said, it, you can't say, well, he didn't say anything about Jack Daniels. No, it's, it's anything intoxicating. Okay, so, so you know, there's, there's no exception here for legal marijuana, right? This, there's no exception here for being addicted to any kind of narcotic or anything, right? That, the whole idea is that you're not mastered by something. You're not addicted to something. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so the man or woman of God who serves in the church ought not to be a person who's mastered by anything other than the Lord. Amen. 
not fond of sordid gain. Again, this is one we went through. Uh, the language in verse 3 says, free from the love of money. Here, it's, he, he puts it a little bit differently. I always like the King James language on this one. Uh, not, not greedy of filthy lucre. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <coughs> just, you know, anytime you can use filthy lucre, you know, it's just... <laughs> There's a temptation in all of our lives to cheat a little. You can cheat a little. Cheat a little here, cheat a little there. Christians should be careful, and leaders should be careful not to be cheaters, not to be fond of sordid gain. Not to be fond of ill-gotten gain. They should, it says, hold to the mystery or be holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. This is beautiful language. Holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. We don't oftentimes think about this in, re in regard to deacons. We think, well, the elders or the pastor, they can hold on to the mystery. I just want to fix the toilet or whatever. You know, it's like, no. If you have this office, there's more expected of you than just to do some work. You've got to be a Christian, right? If you're going to serve in the church of Jesus Christ, you should be a Christian. Notice when they named the deacons in Acts chapter 6, they sought men who were filled with the Holy Spirit. These were spiritual men. The people who serve in the church should be Christians who are filled with the Spirit of God and doctrinally sound. Just because you're a deacon and not an elder or overseer doesn't mean you can kind of have willy-nilly doctrine. Stephen wasn't martyred because he was distributing food to the poor, right? Stephen, who was that, one of those first named deacons, he was then martyred. He wasn't killed because he was doing some you know, manual labor task serving people, he was preaching. There's some overlap here in the different ministries. He was preaching Jesus. And it says in Acts chapter 6, verse 10, they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He knew, he understood the mystery of the faith. I like to tell the story, maybe you've heard it before, Hopefully you don't know the guy I'm talking about, but I remember one time I was, I was at home. Uh, I think it was on a Saturday. There was some event going on at the church, and uh, there was a deacon who was there at the church who was supposed to be kind of responsible for overseeing for security or something. And uh, he called me up and he said, hey, uh, hey, Pastor Jim, there's, there's this young guy at church. There's this event going on, but I'm here guarding the door. And this young guy came to the door and he, he wants to talk to somebody. I'm like, Okay. He says, yeah, he seems kind of disturbed. I'm like, okay. Talk to him. Oh, well, what am I going to say? What, what he wanted me to do, he wanted me to get in the car, come to the church, and take care of that for him. And I just said, dude, you're, you're there. Minister to him. Talk to him. Pray for him. Tell him about Jesus. Right? That's what I would, I would just come. I would listen to the guy, and I'd look for an opportunity to give him Jesus. We're not going to, on a Saturday afternoon, we're not going to fix his, all the problems in his life, but he might need to be saved. And this guy, I, on the other end of the phone, I know, I just could see the, the blank stare as he just kind of had to process, like, what, you want me to say something? Yes, Christian brother. That's a, that's a reasonable expectation of any Christian. Certainly for someone who holds the office, you know, and has some kind of responsibility. The gospel is no good if only agreed upon, communicated, and yet unapplied in the leader's life. It's got to be received. It's got to be believed. It's got to be held on to. I, I, I think that's a very, very important distinction. The, the, the deacon ought to understand the mystery of the faith, which really isn't any mystery at all. It's just Jesus. Everyone who serves at church should understand Jesus Christ 
And then they ought to have a clear conscience, meaning they are believers. They're trusting in him. They've applied the mystery of the faith in their own life. It says they ought to be tested. It's interesting that in this one, he hadn't said that about the overseers, but then you have this whole idea that it's, they're linked together. And then in verse 8, he says, and uh, also, uh, so I, I think there's no sense that, you know, that the elders aren't tested as well, but he's just making it really clear here in regard to the office of deacon. They ought to, have, they ought to be tested. There ought to be, you know, obviously we've got this list of qualifications, and it's not like we want to judge people, right? People right away go, oh, you're getting all judgy on us. No, but there's qualifications, there's things that you ought to minimally kind of measure up if you want to serve. Especially, again, we're talking about an office in the church, a, 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 a kind of a named position. This week, uh, it was just a crummy week, I'll tell you. I, had, I got sick on Tuesday, um, and then our garage door broke. Uh, you know, we got the old one-piece garage doors, and so I'm like, I'm at home, I'm sick, I'm all just like a mess, and trying to get... You know, because I actually, the door went up and then it wouldn't go back down. And so I'm calling around and everyone I called said, nope, nope, we don't work on those. You got to replace it. It's like, what? Don't tell me. If you know different, don't say anything, please. <laughs> God bless you. So anyway, uh, I hired, uh, I got two bids. I had a couple of different contractors come out this week and give me bids on the garage door, and we're going to get wonderful new garage doors. I'm so excited. But you know, when the guys rolled in, uh, there was two different companies. One responded, boom, just like that, I'll be there today. Oh, okay, I like that. The other guy, you know, I can come on Thursday. Okay. One guy had a really nice, clean truck. I mean, it was a nice construction, you know, truck, but it was clean and organized looking. He was like well kept, just looked sharp and, you know, just had all it, everything down. Cat, here's your catalog, you know. The other guy, he kind of rolled out of his truck and yeah, he looked at it and, you know, he didn't have a catalog for me. And do you understand what I'm, what I'm telling you, what I'm explaining to you? Uh, I'm testing these guys because I'm about to give them a bunch of money. And I'm looking at them and everything about them. Not because I'm expecting that there's going to be two different products necessarily. I'm assuming both of these guys are going to do a good job. Uh, and, and I'm looking at the bottom line as well. Right? But, I, but I'm, I'm fi trying to figure out who do I want to give my money to? The guy who I think has kind of got it together? Or the guy that I think, yeah, I think he might show up on time. Right? And it just so happened that the guy who had it all together also was, had a better price. So I'm going with him. I'll let you know how it goes. But my point is, uh, they were both tested and they knew they were being tested. I would assume you're going out to bid a job. You know, it's a job interview. You're going to, you know, I'm the consumer. I'm making a decision who I'm giving my money to. Why wouldn't we do that in the church of Jesus Christ? Not, not in the sense of judgment. It's like, I'm not judging these guys in the sense of loser. You know, it's not like that. But it's like, but it's like I'm, uh, there's a responsibility. They're, they're, they're trying, they want the job. In the church, we ought to have some standards. And I think that's Paul's point. As the church grows and as the church functions, the institution of the church, there ought to be some standards and there's spiritual standards. Not just anyone can come in and take over or lead. And it shouldn't be that way. Who wants that? I mean, you know, it should at least be we should scrutinize as much as we would a guy who's putting in the garage door. We should be careful whom we allow to lead the church of Jesus Christ. Now, he talks about women. Women. Gals, you'll love this. I love it, actually. Verse 11, he says, Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but be temperate, faithful in all things. The role of women here, it's, uh, it's debated. There are good 
scholars uh, divided on this because the word uh, translated women uh, could be translated wives. It's the same word. And in, 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 a, in, depending on the context, it's translated wife, wife or wives uh, or women. But it is the same word. And some say, well, no, 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 no. He's talking about the, the, the deacon's wives. The deacon's wives need to be, you know, otherwise he's disqualified. Um, I, I, I'm, I don't believe that's what he's talking about, and I think there's quite a few reasons uh, why. Uh, notice the word likewise that's there again. So he's used that word a couple times now. So he's talking about when he transitioned from the overseers to the deacons, he used the word likewise, saying, hey, here's qualifications for those guys. Now, likewise, the deacons have qualifications. And now he uses the word again, likewise, the women. So that's just uh, one of the reasons. But then we've got the, uh, the bulk of the New Testament and Paul's writings where he's constantly talking about women serving in the church. Look at Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. This language, I think, of all of his language is, is so clear and so strong. He says, I commend to you, writing to the church here, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Centuria. The language is very, very clear. He's not saying, hey, I want to commend to you. I want you guys to receive this gal, uh, Phoebe. She's a great worker. No, he calls her a servant of the church, which is at Centria. He says, receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself also has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Sound like a deacon to you? Phoebe sounds like a deacon to me. And it's, that's the, the words. Uh, no, actually, the word's not used, but she's a servant of the church. So, um, I believe he's talking about deaconesses. He's talking about women who serve in the official capacity as deacons. They're not the ones teaching. They're not exercising authority, but they can hold the office of deacon. And it's not like that's a, a, a minority opinion. Um, I don't know what the percentage is, but I think the there's a, the, the bulk of um, teachers that I know uh, see it that way. So, there you go. Women, women are qualified to be deacons, for sure. And the truth is, uh, again, if you look at Paul's writings, he's, he's constantly uh, talking about women. Women who opened up their home, women who did this and that. And the truth is, uh, that's who gets the work done. I mean, a lot of the, the, the work of the church gets done by women. Uh, just, just go look at the roles of who's teaching Sunday school. Although we got a pretty good, we got a pretty good crew of men who teach Sunday school. But, um, you know, Anna, our administrator, uh, though she's paid, she's staff. Uh, she's only staff because she's first a deacon. I mean, she is... She's a hard worker, and she, puts, she, she makes me look good in a lot of ways. So uh, my, wife, my wife is a deaconess. Deaconess. She, um, she serves. She makes me look good most of the time. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> oh. They got to be dignified. So, so there's, th th this is just a general... Uh, you know, idea that if, if a woman is a, is a deacon, they, they ought to be uh, dignified, just like the guy's got to be dignified. They shouldn't be gossips. Again, the, you know, he's not saying, oh, now the men, they can be gossips, but the women. <laughs> and I don't want to make any sexist statements here, but he does kind of tag the malicious gossips with uh, the women for some reason. I don't know. I'm not qualified to make any comments on that. Uh, just leaders, you know, leaders out of necessity, we know things, right? Leaders know things, especially when it comes to discipline in the church and issues in the church. We know things. We know what's going on in people's lives sometimes. We have to, and we should, but we shouldn't gossip about it. And, and um, you know, that 
even, you know, he, he says not even just gossips, malicious gossips. Uh, it's a really important that any leaders in the church, we have to be careful with uh, the things that we know uh, to be tight-lipped and to just, um, you know, just keep things to ourselves. They need to be temperate. We talked about that last week. It's just the idea of sober-minded, uh, so sober in their thinking. Uh, I love this one, and I think this is so important. Uh, if you're going to serve in the church, you need to be faithful in all things. Faithful in all things. What things? All things. Faithful. I, this can't be stressed enough. If you're on the schedule, you should show up. Don't you think? Over the years, I've seen this so many times where people blow off some service at church like it's not important. And they treat it and can treat it uh, way differently than they would in a, you know, a job. Like if you've got a job, you don't just not show up, do you? <laughs> you don't have a job for very long if you do that. Because, we, you know, you, you don't do that. And, and if you've got a job and you're responsible to a job, you don't, you don't call in, you don't call out all the time just because you want to goof off, right? Or you're not going to have that job for very long. But for some reason, uh, sometimes we see people who have committed to serve at church and they feel like that's an easy thing to blow off. And I just scratch my head because you realize s serving at church you're serving God. And this is serious. Even if, even if it's the nursery, it's an important aspect to what we do, to the functioning of the body of Christ. You should be faithful in all things. I think it's important. I'm glad that he mentioned it. He talks about, again, be the husband of only one wife and good manager of your children and your households. Uh, so, you know, he, he talked about these things with the elders. I want to talk about this in a little bit different way because I think it, uh, it needs to be said, serving at church, and, and when we're talking about the office of a deacon, you're talking about something that maybe someone's required to kind of regularly serve, right? Like on a schedule. It's hard to do. Our lives are busy, right? Most people's lives, living in America, we're busy. We have busy lives. We have uh, busy families. We have, you know, work life and family life. It's a difficult thing to manage a marriage, to manage a family, to manage work, to manage your own household, to make sure your kids are in line. And then find time to serve at church. I think if it was an easy thing, we'd have more people signing up to serve. But it's a difficult thing. It's the very definition of management, right? In order to do all those things, and in order to do all those things well, you've got to be able to manage time. When it comes to the management of time, I think it's a lot like the management of money. Two things that we often find that we have precious little of, time and money, right? Well, you know, the Lord, he, he has so much to say about managing our own wealth, managing our own money. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. If you are a generous person, if you're a person who's learned to give, you've learned the spiritual principle that God gives us in His Word. And that is that, that He requires, really, that we trust Him by faith. It doesn't make sense. Like, like if you pencil out your finances and go, oh, I'm going to take this big chunk right off the top. 10% right off the top. I'm going to give that to the Lord. That never makes sense. 
unless you're thinking spiritually and applying what the Word of God says. And what the Word of God says is do this, and you know what? You're going to be blessed. It says it over and over and over in a hundred different ways. And I found it to be true. The same principle applies to time. And it's not, a, it's not a new thing. It's an old thing. Remember what the Lord said of the Sabbath day. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. God's command to the nation. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner stays with you. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Holy, holy, holy. He uses that language. It means it's consecrated. It's set apart for one particular thing. He says one of the days of the week... You should set aside and, and not work, not labor, not make money, not go get overtime. Hang out with your family. Relax. Rest. Watch a little football, maybe. Sorry, ladies. No, no. No, just ra- go to church. Worship the Lord. Spend time with your family. You need to do this. This is a command that God gave to the people. Now, it doesn't make any sense. To, to us Westerners, us capitalists, us, and especially you guys who are achievers, it's like, oh, I'm not going to waste a whole day doing nothing. I can get some stuff done. And so we, we take that overtime shift when we don't necessarily need to. Or we just work. Instead of hanging out with our kids, we work. And the whole while, the Lord is saying, you know what, do you trust me? Do you trust me with your time? It's my time, by the way. I am the Lord. And I've given you an example to follow. He gave us the example to follow. He rested. Time resting, time with family, time going to church is not time wasted. It's faith exercised. Now, here's the application for this. With, with your money, God says, trust me. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. It's not going to make sense to your accountant. You need to trust me. It's a thing of faith. With, with the days of the week, he says, you need to trust me. Does it make sense? No, it makes much more sense to, to work on that seventh day and you get way more done. It's, it works the same way, though, on a daily basis. You get up in the morning and you just rush into the day. Right? You rush into the day and and your day is filled with activity. Your day is filled with busyness. And oftentimes, you're busy from the day that you're from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. And I would just propose to you, I would just propose to you that there goes a deacon right there couple of deacons at work. Three deacons working right now. Uh, if, you, if you would trust the Lord with your day, in the same way in these other areas, if you would trust the Lord, give Him the first of your day. Spend time with the Lord in the first of the day. He will multiply your energy the rest of the day. I believe that with all my heart. God blesses obedience. God blesses when we trust Him with what He's given us. And and so this whole idea of, well, I don't have time to serve. No, you don't have time to serve because you're not trusting the Lord with the time that He's given you. But if you would take time every day, uh, just like we take time on Sunday or, you know, whatever your Sabbath rest might be, take time every day. You know, if you, if you don't have time in the morning, you need to go to bed earlier and get up a little bit earlier, right? And, and we all know, hopefully we all know, I certainly know, there's a big difference between the day that I, get, that I sleep in, right, and, and, I, and I don't get up and spend that time with the Lord before the day gets busy, and those precious days when I get up early. 
and I have my time with the Lord alone, and I get ready for the day. My day is better. And I would just say, my day is more profitable. Does that make sense? So this whole, what I'm giving you is this whole idea of managing. Managing marriage, managing family life, managing all the, the practical things that you have in your day. You'll have more time if you give the Lord the first part. He says those who, uh, who are or do hold this office, he says, um, uh, Having served well as deacons, they obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in faith that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, this high standing, I think, sometimes can be taken as kind of a, a thing maybe of ego, where it's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm somebody. I've got, you know, a special title. I've got a name badge or something at church. No. It, it, it literally means they're just standing in a good place. When you serve the Lord, you're standing in a good place. It's a good place to be. It's a good thing to do. We were eating lunch. I, it was quite a few years ago, but this is a, kind of a classic story in our family. Um, I think it was a Sunday after church, and uh, we were out eating lunch, and uh, the guy, you know, people chat with you. Oh, how's your day going? And it's like, oh, and it's like, and I just happened to mention, well, I just got done, d- done at work. And the guy, he was an Asian fellow, and he says, oh, you work for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I just had never heard anyone put it that way. And it was like, yeah, that's right. I do. And, and I think, you know, in general, it's like when you serve at church, you're working for Jesus. It's a, it's, a, it's a great place to stand. It's a, it's a high honor. And remember, this work that we're involved in, in regard to the functioning of the church, that's really what he's talking about. There's this backdrop to the whole thing. Look back at chapter 2, uh, verse 4. God, he says, this is the mission of Christ. He desires men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what we're doing. That's the purpose and the, that's, that's God's purpose and that's what he's doing through the functioning of the church. People are getting trained. People are getting taught. People are having an opportunity to, to serve and to grow. It's a wonderful thing. When we go back into Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, and we examine the early church deacons, they they signed up, they were qualified, they were signed up, hey, we need some help serving these people. Can you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Stephen gets named the deacon in Acts chapter 6, he preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 7, and then he's killed. He's martyred for that work. He's standing in a good place. It might seem like a terrible, tragic thing. But we all know the story. There was the man Saul was witnessing the whole thing and it had an impact on his life. It kind of changed everything. What an honor it was for Stephen. He was working for Jesus. As the story goes on, one of the other deacons that was mentioned was Philip. Philip was there. He was qualified. He was named. He was given this task to do. After the martyring of Stephen, after Stephen was killed there publicly, the church was scattered. And it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. He had a good standing And he had confidence. It's a good work that these guys were called to do. And God used them for his own glory. Now in verse 15, Paul again gives us this overall uh, purpose. I write so that You will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. 
He wants us to know how to conduct ourselves in this thing that we call church. I want to take this a little bit backwards. He calls it the pillar and support of the truth. How did we get here? He's talking about overseers of the church. Now he's talking about deacons, those who serve practically in the church. And he says, oh, by the way, let me lay this on you. This thing that we do, that we're part of, that's called, we're the pillar and the support of the truth. This isn't the Boy Scouts. This isn't the fraternal order of eagles. I'm not trying to disparage any other groups, right? But this isn't just some fellowship of people who come together and rah-rah each other. We're the pillar in support of the truth. What is that? Truth is the foundation of the church, and the church is the foundation of the truth. We hold on to the truth. When we come together and talk about stuff, it's like I'm, I'm teaching, I'm preaching. What am I preaching? I'm preaching the truth of God's Word. It's the foundation of truth, the very foundation of truth. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Actually, you don't need to turn there. We're out of time, but... You know the story in Matthew... Chapter 16, Jesus asks the disciples, who do, who do you say that the Son of Man is? Or who do, who do people say? And then he, he, he makes it more personal. What do you say? And Peter answered him and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that truth, Jesus affirms and celebrates in uh, Matthew 16, 18. He says, I say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gate, gates of Hades will not overpower it. All Peter said was, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. No one else is saying it. We're saying it. And when we come together, we're affirming it over and over and over again. We worship Jesus Christ. We serve Jesus Christ. We're believing in Jesus Christ. We are hoping in Jesus Christ. For now and for the future, for all eternity, the church, we are the pillar and the support of the truth, and that truth is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's a serious thing. The church of the living God. It's a, uh, the word church there is ecclesia. It's the assembly. It's the congregation. Notice uh, when, when Peter gives his confession, he says, you're the, the Christ, the son of the living God. It's the same thing that Paul says here, the, the living God. There's a distinction made over and over again. This is part of the truth that we hold on to. Our God is alive. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is risen from the dead. He's not like the pagan gods, which, by, by the way, they don't live. They're not alive. We're of the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. The household of God is His earthly habitation, place where He dwells. He lives with us. He lives here in us. And He desires to express Himself to the world in us and through us. This is the whole thing that Paul gave us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about the body of Christ. You, each one of us, members of the body of Christ, each one has a part, each one has a role. Each one has opportunity and place to serve. We need to be reminded of these things. What we do is important. Men have a role, as he's articulated. Men have a role of leadership and of prayer. These things overlap, but women have roles, wonderful roles as teachers, worshipers, prayer warriors, so many things. There's roles of leadership that have been articulated, overseers, and he calls that a fine work. And those who serve as deacons, who serve like the master. Look at verse 16. 
this uh, ancient creed, probably, like I said earlier, uh, possibly part of an early hymn. It's six lines in three different couplets. He says, by common confession, so there are things that are agreed upon. By common confession, the mystery of godliness, the gospel, uh, formerly a mystery, now revealed in Jesus. It says he was revealed in the flesh, he was vindicated in the spirit. This is the incarnation itself. God became a man. He was fully God as evidenced by the Spirit who raised him. He was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations. So again, there's these kind of contrasting things. He was seen by angels and yet proclaimed among the nations. For our Christmas messages, we're going to be focusing on the the different proclamations that the angels made. The birth of Christ announced by angels. Angels were involved in Jesus' life. They were there at His death, at His resurrection. He was ministered to by angels. Angels at the empty tomb. He was seen by angels. He even announced by them and then now proclaimed among the nations. This is what we're involved in. These are our voices proclaiming Him. This is the work of the church. Our voices joining theirs during the church age to proclaim Him. And then these last two, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. The work of the church, believing in, celebrating the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who is in heaven. He's taken up in glory. And I think there's a reminder there and for all, for all of us and for all the ages that we have a home in heaven where He is and we'll be with Him one day. Paul closes these things out and says, hey, here's, here's the work. Here's the work that's going on. As he closes, he reminds us just to take a look once again at Jesus Christ. And to hang on to him. This is serious work. It's good work to be involved in the work of the church. Let's have the band come up. As they do, we'll have communion this morning. Another opportunity for us to reflect on the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. I hope you're, uh, in thinking about these things regarding service, I would just ask you to pray, to pray about um, what you do and what you could do, um, whether it's, it's something here in the building of the church or maybe by extension the, the body of the church and all the different homes and uh, the different needs that go on. If you don't have a place that you can see, hey, you know what? I think the Lord would have me serve in that capacity. You know, you can always ask. It doesn't happen a whole lot where people come up and say, what could I do? I've got a list, though. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that um, we get to be part of this great thing that you're doing. While we wait for you, Jesus, we want to be busy. Not just busy with busy work, but busy uh, doing the things that you desire. Enhancing and, and helping in it, your work of the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to search our own hearts and to to ask the deep questions of you, Lord, what could I do? What would you have me do, Lord? And may we just respond with whatever you say, Lord. May we just respond with obedience. May we trust you. As we take communion this morning, we reflect on your service on behalf of us. Lord, you came and served us by giving your own life. You taught us how to serve. 
how to lay down, how to sacrifice. I pray that we would respond as we reflect and remember your work of the cross. Thank you for dying in our place and for paying the penalty for our sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you know.